Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here to the last um, ABC One Word ABC seminar. Um, today is my pleasure to introduce Matti Viola, um, who is associate professor at the University of uh, Uves Kuda, um, and is working in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. He is a leading expert in uh, computational statistics and um, applied probability. Today he will delicious with um, a topic title, a, um, a talk title on the use of ABC and CMC with inflated tolerance and post correction. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is joint work with my with my former PhD student Jordan Frank. So this was actually part of his PhD a couple of years ago. So please interrupt me at any point if you have questions. That's okay. I think we should have plenty of time. Okay, so I will start by sort of saying what's ABC. Probably most of you know it quite well, but you can take this as a presentation of the notation then. So I will have the setting where I have just a model which consists of the prior, which is the prior density there, ER and the observation model, which is denoted by G. And Y star is the observed data. So if we were doing just basic uh, Bayesian inference, or if we were able to do that, we would be looking at the posterior, which is proportional to the prior times the likelihood, as usual. But of course, in ABC, this, this cannot be done, or ABC is four cases where you cannot do this well. So why is that? It's because in, in some cases, or quite, quite, quite a few cases, you can implement the simulator, but you cannot evaluate the likelihood of that simulator. So if you ca cannot evaluate the likelihood, then you cannot sort of do MCMC to the, to the posterior pi directly. But as I said, we, the ABC is for the settings where you have a simulator. So you can basically simulate pseudo data, Y, for any parameter value theta. And at least in this talk, I will assume that this simulation is also quite cheap. So you can do a, a lot of these simulations. And this is the, perhaps the simplest, maybe for probably the thing where it all started. So the ABC rejection sampler. So this is, basically just um, really quite simple simulation algorithm. What we do is that we simulate theta parameters from the prior and then Y conditional on theta from G. So this is just, R1 is just unconditional model simulation, right? And then the, the other step is that whether we accept or reject, that will compare the, the pseudo data y, whether they are close to the observed data y star, in particular, whether some summaries calculated from those data are close, usually in terms of the Euclidean distance. I'm fixing these for being sort of more transparent for now, but of course you can generalize in the end. So basically this is an accept reject sampler produces the, this thing here produces one sample, but of course you can iterate it and get n samples out of some distribution. And actually you can, you can write down the distribution up to a normalizing constant. Well, it's just the law of the unconditional simulation, which is prior times, oh, prior times the observation model G. And then you have the indicator function there indicating whether you accept or reject. Pictorially, it may look something like this if you are in a really simple setting where both your parameter and your data are uh, one dimensional. So as in this case, actually the prior density is just normal. And also the observation model is normal. So you simulate one point by drawing one theta somewhere and then you simulate one y, corresponding y there. And the rejection sampler simulates a lot of samples and only accepts 
some of them that happen to be close to the observed summary, which is 0 0.42 in this example here. And we've used the tolerance epsilon one here. So it's just the, how much you can differ in terms of the summary from the observed value. Okay. So uh, usually we sort of don't really care about the, the simulated pseudo data. We are interested in the parameter theta. So it makes a lot of sense to sort of think about what's the marginal distribution. So we know that this is the joint distribution of this rejection sampler or ABC. Um, then maybe we are interested only in the parameter theta. So we want to sort of look at the marginal of this. So we can just integrate and we get the marginal. So if we denote this integral here over G and this indicator function as L epsilon Y star, then this is sort of a pseudo likelihood in a way an approximation of the, of the true likelihood. And that's actually just in this setting, a probability that you, that you will hit close enough to the observed data when you simulate from with parameters theta. Okay, and just to recap how this tolerance par parameter affects what the pseudo posterior is. Well, the simplest simple thing is that if you just let epsilon grow, tolerance grow, you can also think what happens here if you increase the tolerance, you just increase the width of this strip where you accept. So of course, when you increase, 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 you end up sort of accepting everything. And also, if you look at the expression here, this probability would go to one if epsilon goes to infinity. So, so you sort of see that if epsilon is really large, you end up actually having the ABC posterior being almost prior. And then in the other more interesting case where you sort of have epsilon quite small, what happens? Well, if epsilon really would go to zero, then in fact, under some conditions, at least uh, you have a sufficient statistic S and some further regularity conditions perhaps, but not too much uh, on top of that. So basically then the approximate or the pseudo likelihood would converge up to a constant to the, to your true likelihood. Okay. And this can be seen also that in this example, in a way, if you think about what is the, if you have a theta here and you look, look at the probability of accepting, if you have a really narrow strip here, it's rather easy to see that this probability would be just two times epsilon or two times the tolerance times the likelihood if epsilon is really small. So in a way, the, the story here is that uh, the tolerance is important in ABC, of course, as probably all of you know. And, and in a way, ideally, you would like to push the tolerance as low as possible. But in practice, you cannot do it because if you look at the rejection sampler here, you can imagine what happens if epsilon is really small. You accept just nothing because you, you are very, very, if this is really narrow, the probability is very small that you accept. So that's not good. So you need a lot of model simulations if epsilon is really small. So it's a balance, but ideally you would like to push the tolerance as low as possible. Well, here's an example, which is I think a classic in the ABC papers. Um, it's going to be sort of a running example. So that's, that's why I present it quickly here. So it's just a simple bivariate uh, Markov process on the positive integers, which is just basically has three kind of moves. So you can, these uh, X's and Y's or the two parameters of the process or the state can go up or down by one 
at any time. But basically, this is a continuous time Markov process. And he has a realization of that. The point being here, this, why, why this is sort of an interesting example is that uh, this is rather easy to simulate, but the likelihood is not so nice of this process. So likelihood is hard, but simulation easy. So that's why this is interesting. So this is just a simulation with certain starting values and certain thetas. And now I've done ABC here to, to this, basically this, this day with this data and for this model. And for that, I also have to define a prior. So I define just a uniform prior on this uh, hypercube on, and basically it's for the log thetas. And then I use some summaries of the data, which are not so important, but anyway, they are sort of uh, summaries calculated from the process values, uh, which are five time units apart from each other. Anyway, five summaries, which are almost arbitrary. And if I do ABC inference with a certain tolerance, I get inference that is somehow reasonable because I simulated the data with these parameter values and I sort of get pseudo posterior or the ABC inference that is at least looks promising because the, param the, the, the pseudo posterior is sort of concentrated where the true values are. So this is sort of looking nice. But the thing is that actually even this model would be not so nice with the rejection sampling variant because already I would have a very small probability of acceptance if I use this tolerance. So you can, you can sort of overcome some difficulties of the rejection sampling ABC by going to the ABC MC MC, which is going to be the main thing of this talk. So the ABC MCMC is just an MCMC with the same target distribution as the rejection sampler. The point is that you just do something a little bit more clever than drawing from the prior. Okay, here's basically the ABC MCMC and I'm just highlighting here things which are not quite the same as with standard MCMC. So you could imagine that actually if you would do normal base inference in place of these L's, you would have the true likelihood L Y star given theta K, theta K prime and so forth. But here we just, as with the rejection sampling version, we simulate data set of the pseudo data sets Y K prime. We calculate whether they hit close and then we accept or reject. The only thing is that now our proposals here are not from the prior, they are from a proposal distribution that may depend on the previous state, theta k minus one. So this is a simple algorithm, that's the main point here. And also what can be rather nice is that you can view this as a pseudo marginal MCMC, which means that this is sort of, if you view it as a pseudo marginal MCMC, then the marginal variant of this algorithm is the one where you sort of integrate out the, the simulation of Y and setting LK like this. So instead of look, basically having an indicator here, which end up, ends up being zero or one, you have the probability of accepting. And I stress actually that this is this is purely theoretical in the ABC context because you cannot calculate this probability. You can only implement this simulation and looking at the indicate function. But this can be sort of useful to view this ABC MCMC through this pseudo marginal context and looking at the marginal variant of the ABC MCMC. So the point is that then in, instead of these um, random variables generated at each time instant, we actually have in the marginal version, we have the pseudo, -likely, uh, pseudo likelihood there. 
So this, this looks like normal Metropolis Hastings with this pseudo likelihood. That's the thing. I'm coming back to the marginal ABC MCMC in a moment. But first, um, why would you sort of uh, care about ABC MCMC in the first place? So, so why would you use it instead of rejection sampling ABC, for instance? Well, one thing is that, as I said, rejection sampling can be bad because you sample from the prior, so you may, uh, may end up reject, rejecting a lot of samples. And indeed, if you want to do ABC inference in a case where you have uninformative or even improper prior, you can still use ABC, MC, MC, but the rejection of something wouldn't be good or wouldn't be maybe useful at all. Or you wouldn't maybe be able to use it at all. Um, there are some convergence guarantees, at least to the pseudo posterior. And the point of this talk is to say that it can be simple to use ABC, MC, MC. So that's the main thing here. But I must say that I've been looking at other presentations in this seminar series. So ABC, MC, MC is going to be very limited. So, so you have to have rather cheap to simulate model because MC, MC will require a lot of simulations. That is just how MC, MC is. You have to iterate. So basically, if you can only afford a hundred simulations or something like that, you shouldn't be going to ABC, MC, MC, but rather look at some of the more sophisticated methods. Also, because we are going to use MC, MC, often you need, uh, or with MC, MC, often you need moderate dimension, and this is how we are going to be constrained as well. So we need moderate dimension on the parameter we are going to sample, the theta, and also somehow implicitly in the summary, but actually the, I suppose the summary of the dimension, uh, uh, the dimension of the summary and the parameter go hand in hand in most cases in the ABC. So, so that's almost the same thing. So just, just the thing that if you have a model which is hard to simulate or has a lot of parameters, maybe this talk is not for you. Rather, I stress the simplicity, hopefully getting something that is simple to use to get an inference done. And what, what we suggest and, and uh, in, the, in the paper is an adaptive ABC, MC, MC, and what it requires actually you to specify are these five things. So you have to have an initial guess of the parameters. That's as things often are in MCMC, MC, you have to have an initial value, not a good initial value, but some initial value. You can take a draw from the prior if you like. The, uh, the prior density, the observed summaries, that's standard. Uh, and then you have to uh, supply a simulator of the summaries. Well, of course, this is, this is your model. This is sort of the hard bit but this is what you have to implement always when you start to do ABC or something like that. The only real parameter, tunable parameter is the number of MCMC -MC iterations. So this is a number that is as large as you can afford to wait basically. So just to sort of uh, make this concrete, we've implemented a package uh, in Julia and basically this is what you really need to supply to the function ABC, MC, MC, and it does the, the thing. But now you probably are interested in what that function ABC, MC, MC actually does. So this is what it does. It's, it's adaptive uh, ABC, MC, MC. So I've highlighted here sort of the things that are different to the standard ABC, MC, uh, ABC, MC, MC. So in the ABC MCMC, we had Q here. That's just fixed proposal kernel. 
And here we had the tolerance epsilon of accept. But now we are actually tuning the proposal distribution and the tolerance uh, as we sort of progress. So this is one iteration of the algorithm. And we are tuning that by sort of doing some sort of adaptation. And so, so the thing is that this is going to be actually just a random walk proposal. So uh, theta k prime is going to be just theta k minus one plus an independent increment that has a covariance proportional to gamma k minus one, right? And then we have these adaptation rules here. And some step sizes and we sort of suggest this this specific step size here. If you've done a bit of adaptive MCMC, you probably recognize the two first uh, uh, recursions here. They are just the mean covariance update of the adaptive metropolis, or in particular, the stochastic approximation version. But that's rather standard in a way. That's how you often tune the random walk metropolis algorithm. What's a little bit more uh, specific here or specific to the ABC is this um, tolerance adaptation here. And this may also look familiar to you from other contexts. This is basically the same rule that you can use to, to adapt the scaling of a random walk metropolis. But here, instead of the scaling of the random walk, we are actually adapting the tolerance of the ABC. So in a way, this is very much uh, using building blocks from the, from the past, but it seems to work reasonably okay. So that's the point. So if we look at the accept rate adaptation here, you may wonder what are we trying to do? So, so in a way it's, in a way, why we do this adaptation in the first place is that we want to avoid uh, the kind of user-defined parameters. We want to make the method automatic so that you don't have to supply tons of parameters, but just one. So why this adaptation might work quite well is that in a way, this tolerance adaptation is made for ensuring that we maintain a certain accept rate. So actually we, we sort of target a certain desired acceptance rate, alpha star. And in fact, if you, uh, we made this observation that the mean accept rate is really increasing function of the tolerance. It's not surprising, but anyway, you have to do something to show it. But in a way, this tolerance adaptation seems reasonable once you make this observation. So if you have too small accept rate, you just increase the tolerance and vice versa. So in some sense, up to a proof, uh, you would have sort of convergent adaptation, perhaps. The thing is that how do you choose the alpha star in this context? And for that, we sort of need actually this AM thing. We have to couple the tolerance adaptation with the adaptive metropolis to sort of actually have a fixed alpha star that we have a hope for working for a range of targets or range of scenarios. So in a way, what's the logic of choosing the alpha star? It's sort of imagining uh, what would happen sort of in the limit if we use this AM adaptation. So if we look at a simplified scenario, so we're looking at basically the pseudo posteriors with different tolerances delta. If we, for, for the sake of uh, simplicity for now, if you assume these to be exactly Gaussians, all of these, then this AM adaptation would actually, if we would fix the tolerance, that would lead to mean accept rate that is less than 
alpha opt, where alpha opt is in this range. So this is coming from the how random walk metropolis behaves. And why is that? Well, first, if the tolerance is really high, then in basically we we just act, we you know the, the the ABC bit or comparing the summaries disappears, and we only end up doing random walk from the prior. So then we would have a random walk, and we know what happens in the limit. And for any delta, if we look at the marginal variant of ABC MCMC, that would be still the random walk metropolis. And that would still have the, this accept rate. Uh, and we know that because ABC MCMC is a pseudo marginal version of that marginal, we know that the accept rate or mean accept rate is less than that. And also we know that if we decrease tolerance too much, then the accept rate will just degenerate to, to zero. So in some sense, you end up with the conclusion that the alpha star would have to be in that range. Because in a way, if we know that at least from the, if we have delta really high, we are essentially something from the prior, then this might be 0 0.234. So we want to make the tolerance smaller so that we actually don't sample from the prior, but we sort of try to, well, go closer to the true posterior. So we decrease delta. But at the same time, we don't want to make this accept rate too low, because then the MCMC stops mixing, or oh, that won't be well mixing. And it's probably even worse with adaptation if we have low accept rate. Matti. Yes. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes. When, when you say, okay, it's known that the acceptance rate of pseudo merger methods is, is less, why, why, or at least specifically for ABC and CMC, I, I guess you're talking. Yes. Uh, where do we know that it's generally smaller than the acceptance rate for a marginal uh, ABC and CMC? Yes. So actually, yeah, I, that's unfortunate. I didn't add the citation. Is it, it's our paper, my paper with Christoph, at least, where we where we observe that. Okay. So yes. Thanks. It's a general result for the pseudo marginals. Yes. Good. Thanks for the for the question. So yes. So in a way, uh, in, uh, guided by this thing here, and sort of thinking about the balance, we know we sort of know that it should be some, something in between here. And well, we don't have sort of a definite answer what's the good thing, but we sort of say that, well, let's say 10% 10, 10 accept rate, that will still give us a reasonably mixing MCMC if you accept uh, uh, one out of 10 samples on average. But in a way, hopefully that will be enough so that you are not sampling from the prior anymore. You are sort of informed really by the, by the summaries being close to the, the right ones. Okay. Another thing which is sort of not really theoretically uh, explicit in our thing is that we do initialize the delta, the tolerance to be the basically the distance of the summaries with initial th theta. And this is actually rather important that you do this. This would basically say that if you if your delta node is like this, you would sort of say that you just accepted the first uh, y the first pseudo data or the theta naught. Typically, if theta naught is far off the tail, it's not really in the typical uh, range of the true posterior. This may be actually far more than the sort of desired accept rate in the end. But actually, it is important that you start with 
a tolerance that makes your algorithm to start mixing and exploring. And then once you sort of find better and better values for theta, then you start to gradually uh, uh, make the delta lower or make it decrease. And in a way, this is doing implicitly something like uh, this explicit annealing scheme, which has been suggested in the ABC MCMC. Not exactly the same, but I suppose in the spirit, something similar. And then also because the changing this tolerance will change the target distribution, we will stop the tolerance adaptation after burning, but we suggest to continue the covariance adaptation also after burning, because that's sort of okay. And in the end, we will have ABC MC MC, which is sort of quite automatic, and it chooses a tolerance for you. The thing is that maybe this 10% accept rate will still give you a little bit too high tolerance to your taste in some sense. I would say that the, the, the rationale here is that we have to have accept rate at least something like 10% to ensure that the MCMC still works. But in a way, this might not be the final result when you have the tolerance dealt. But what you can do in ABC is that you can do post refinement. So if you have sort of tolerance delta, you can, you can further go down the tolerance ladder to something lower epsilon. So with the rejection sampling, that's easy. If we, if we had this picture earlier, so if we accepted the, the ones in green here, with tolerance delta one, we can just out of these green samples, take a subset, which is the refined blue ones with, with any lower tolerance epsilon, right? And that's rather easy in the rejection sampling case, that's really easy because in a way you can see directly that actually the blue ones are also, it, it is the same thing as if you were doing rejection sampling to the epsilon 0.5 in to begin with. They are anyway IRD samples. But in the ABC MCMC, it's not surprising that in a way ABC MCMC can produce the green samples and you can select the subset of these to refine the tolerance. That's, that's in a way understandable. But then the question is how does it affect the posterior mean uncertainty? because there's the MCMC mixing somehow also involved here. And so this is basically what we sort of inspected. So with the lotka Volterra example, the algorithm ended up with delta, the final delta after burning, final tolerance being just over 60. And then you can rather easily calculate sort of posterior mean estimates for the range of decreasing tolerances which are here in black. But you can also equip these with uh, uncertainty, some uncertainty information here. And right, and this is the picture basically, what happens. And this is how I do it in, in the package. So after the, the ABC MCMC run earlier, you just run the post process and the plot and you get these pictures. So in a way this is, Nice because it says that, uh, okay, we ended up with the tolerance just above 60 with uh, being, which ensured the ABC MCMC to have the mean accept rate around 10%. But we see that in a way there is still bias in the posterior mean, which we can reduce by decreasing tolerance. But at some point, of course, the uncertainty, because we don't have many samples left, the uncertainty increases and we shouldn't trust something that may be below 20 or something like that, because you will have a lot of uncertainty there. But you can sort of detect bias or something like that quite easily by calculating these. And nothing takes a lot of time here, actually. This is easy to, 
to do and instant basically. So how did I calculate the, the posterior mean estimates and in particular the confidence intervals? So in fact, uh, you can sort of view this post correction as a self-normalized import on something. And indeed, well, in the case where you really just drop samples that are too far, you wouldn't have to do that necessarily. But this allows uh, generalization to other kernels than the indicator function, if you see what I mean there. This allows for generalizations, but anyway, I write it like this here. So basically, these are just self-normalized importance sampling estimators that uh, these would give you the posterior mean and uh, also the confidence interval if we had independent samples. But you also have to account for the fact that actually you are not sampling independently, but from a Markov chain. So what we suggest is that you calculate integrated autocorrelation time estimate from your chain to your function of interest. And then use this kind of a product form where you plug in the, this uncertainty that depends on the epsilon that comes from the sort of, sort of self-normalized importance something thing but you use the common autocorrelation estimate here. And as I said, at least in the case of simple cutoff, you can actually calculate this uh, in almost linear time. So that's rather nice. Okay, so what's the rationale here? So in a way, if we look at this product here, so the first one under quite general condition con converges to sort of an important sampling correction variance, roughly speaking. And the autocorrelation time, well, if you have a consistent estimator converges to the true autocorrelation time. So that converges to something under some conditions. And I'm sorry, this inequality is the other way. It should be the other way around. Uh, you end up sort of uh, having this rough inequality there, saying that these things, which are the, the true, they, this would be sort of the true uncertainty. The true uncertainty is actually less than what we, what we get typically or roughly. It's not really a strict inequality or anything like that, but you can sort of see that roughly it is like that. And why it is like that, it's because if we look at the integrated autocorrelation where we also incorporate the, the weight, so then for that we have, and this, is, this inequality is the wrong way around as well, we have a rough inequality there and basically in a way if delta is close to epsilon then these are close to each other but then if epsilon is really quite small then you see that you should have something less so it's not it's not exact but in a way it suggests that this may be a sensible thing to do and the other thing, there's a remark that basically, if you would do, if you would sort of uh, attempt to estimate the asymptotic variance of this thing directly, that might also be possible, but I'd say that it's likely unstable for smaller epsilon because you look, have a lot of zeros there. And also computationally, that would be more demanding because you would have for any epsilon, you would have to calculate integrated autocorrelation time estimate. But possible anyway. Now then about some generalizations. So uh, as I said earlier, you can sort of replace the indicator function for, by some kernel, if you like. You can also replace this Euclidean distance by some other dissimilarity function. And that's okay, you can also our uh, sort of results apply there. 
except for the for the just rough justification of the approximate confidence interval that doesn't quite apply in that setting. We still think it's sensible and it seems to be empirically good, but no theoretical backing anymore. And you could also do ABC MCMC with averaged pseudo data. There was there is one result saying that maybe it's not worth it. I don't know whether this is always true, but but I suppose we concentrated on the case where we only simulate one pseudo data per iteration. Right. You, you can also do something similar with the regression correction. So um, you probably know about this. So, so in a way, um, this, this is often quite useful with ABC. As you, as you saw already in my example earlier, there was a bias with the tolerance 60, which sort of seemed to, yeah, there was a clear bias that if you still decrease tolerance, you, you sort of get a different result. So this can be mitigated by doing a regression model, sort of auxiliary regression to the summaries and the parameters. And roughly it's just fitting a linear model, having least square estimates, and then calculating empirical residuals. And roughly that if, of course, this is not um, sort of a good statistical model because it is, we, we have actually something there, which is our actual model. And this may not be true at all, but quite often this is a reasonable approximation. Anyway, if this was, correct if the residuals really followed uh, the, the normal distributions or something like well zero means at least and, and so forth then we would get these corrected estimates to follow sort of the, the distribution we really want anyway this is a sort of a longer story of how the regression is valid but anyway post correction can be useful also with uh, regression because in a way, maybe this linear model sort of fits reasonably okay if we restrict to summaries that are actually quite close to the true ones. Maybe it's sort of locally linear relationship. So, so you can do post correction also with the regression. In general, you end up with a weighted regression and then correction. And you can sort of do something analogous to get an uncertainty, some sort of uncertainty number to the regression, but we have even less theoretical justification for that. Just saying that you can do that and there's also the, the package does it if you just say regress here. You have to supply the epsilons you want to inspect also because it's not cannot calculate that for all and it's different. Anyway, so what's the, what's the thing here? So what I want to say is that hopefully what we did could be useful in, for some people. It's at least it is easy to use if it happens to, to apply to your, your problem. You have easy enough problem basically. You only have to have have to supply the number of iterations, which you can sort of just say that, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a lunch, so I will have my end so that I, it's done after the lunch. There is a Julia package, you can give it a try. Then you can ask why Julia? Well, the short answer is because we need a fast model simulator and it's sort of good in that. Remember that implicitly, ABC, MC, MC always requires sort of large N, large number of iterations. And it's not less in our adaptive thing. The adaptation sort of needs even maybe a little bit more even. You need to have rather low dimension and roughly unimodal pseudo posterior because random walk MC, MC is anyway implicitly assumes that, well, it doesn't work for 
so it's those highly multimodal cases. Uh, the nice thing is that, well, I don't know whether it's, it's nice, but it's, it's maybe hard to predefine the target dollar tolerance in ABC. So here you can sort of the algorithm make, uh, the algorithm decides a tolerance that it uses for simulation. And then you can look at posterior means and uncertainties or any other quantities with smaller tolerance epsilon. And then you can sort of, uh, you can sort of postpone the tolerance issue a bit later. So you can only inspect the toler several tolerances later. Okay, so that's basically all. So thank you. Well, thank you, Matty, for such a nice and interesting talk. I will do a real uh, clap and then people might have the chance of uh, sharing their appreciation in the chat. Um, is there any question or comment from the audience? Okay, why we wait for, I mean, um, Umberto, maybe you can stop recording as we typically do so people don't feel uh, 